once you open to this reality, you don't see different things. You see the same things differently. The world looks very different once you allow yourself to take in the reality of what is happening to 70 some odd billion land animals alone every single year. More farmed animals are slaughtered in one week than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout human history. Hello, and welcome to the Ezra Klein Show on the Vox Media Podcast Network. I usually start these by saying how excited I am for the podcast or how much I think you're going to enjoy it or this is a fun one. That is not what I'm going to say here. Of all the podcasts I've done, this is the one I have the most trepidation about releasing. If you listen regularly to this show, you know I'm a vegan. And the reason I'm vegan is I think the way... We torture and slaughter billions of animals, billions, for food in conditions that we can't even bear to see or hear about. We often have laws against anybody even being allowed to film them. It's one of the great horrors of our age. But but here's something I rarely say. I don't really know how to talk about this. There's nothing I feel as strongly about that I feel as uncomfortable expressing as this. It passes judgment on too many people. It indicts too much. I know how to have a conversation about tax policy or health policy, but but this, no one wants to hear this. You're immediately dismissed as a self-righteous crank, a hippie extremist, or or if you're like me and you're new to this, if you can, I mean, I've got an Instagram feed. You can go find pictures of really delicious looking burgers in it. You're a hypocrite. And what's so weird about this conversation, what makes it so different than, than so many of the ones I have that are actually debate is that no one really disagrees with what you're saying. There isn't really disagreement over whether pigs and cows and chickens feel pain. I don't know people really who defend factory farming. There are laws in every state against cruelty towards animals. If there was a sick cow and you just saw me kicking it, you would stop me. You would be appalled. But these laws, these anti-cruelty laws, they have this one giant loophole. You can be pretty much as cruel as you want to farm animals. You can do to a lamb things you'd be jailed for doing to a cat. This is what makes the way we eat and the way we think about the way we eat so strange. You don't need to accept any new ideas to be horrified. You just need to believe the ideas you already accept. You just need to see what you've been taught to stop seeing. And when you do that, it hurts. I can tell you this. like The world, it becomes gruesome. You see people you love and admire participating in unbelievable cruelty all of the time. You see a world where there is so much suffering being caused for so little reason that it's breathtaking. Uh, I call it taking the green pill. All all of a sudden, you you, you do this one thing. You make this one change in your perception, not even a big one. And a world that seemed completely normal becomes a horror show. I've been thinking about this a lot in the past year. I've been trying to figure out how to talk about it, how to even look at it clearly. And then I read a book by the psychologist Melanie Joy. The, the book is called Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, An Introduction to Carnism. And in it, Joy does something – it's brilliant and it's obvious. It's something we need to do more in a lot of areas in life. She turns the whole question around. Rather than looking at vegans or vegetarians or alternative ways of eating or what is different or what is new, she looks at the main thing. She tries to understand the dominant ideology, the thing most people are doing and participating in, which she calls carnism. She tries to make its ideas and its assumptions visible. There's a paragraph in her book that I want to read to you because it applies to so much more than how we eat. It's such an important way of seeing what is around us. And it's so rare. We're so focused on what is new and different. We, we, we're so trained to look for the aberrant that we forget to look for the mainstream. So she writes, What we refer to as mainstream is simply another way to describe an ideology that is so widespread, so entrenched, that its assumptions and practices are seen as simply common sense. It is considered fact rather than opinion. Its practices are a given rather than a choice. It is the norm. It is the way things are. It's the reason carnism has not been named until now. That's a crazy thought, by the way, that there isn't even a name for the way most of us eat. She writes, when an ideology is entrenched, it is essentially invisible. And that invisibility gives it so much power. This is a conversation about making the invisible visible. And it's a conversation, and you'll hear this, that I am still trying to figure out how to have. Its boundaries are not as clear to me. Its tripwires are more opaque. So I hope 
you'll be generous as I try to talk my way through it. Uh, I don't want this to be a conversation that makes people feel defensive or one that intimidates people out of listening to it. In many ways, it's a conversation where I am trying to figure out the way I ate for almost my entire life. And it's a conversation in which I'm trying to figure out how for a very long time I did something every day all the time that I knew perfectly well was wrong. Like, how did I just put that out of my mind? And, and what does that mean about the kind of person I am? Now, look, you might hear this and in us trying to make the, the dominant ideology, making carnism more visible, maybe you'll think it makes sense. Maybe you've got a good argument about why it's the right thing to do. Or maybe you'll see this dynamic somewhere else that is more important to you. The, the, the lens that Joy offers here, it is valuable in a lot of places aside from this one. But I think this is worth doing. And I think this is a conversation worth hearing, even if love eating meat, even if this makes you a little bit uncomfortable. I do hope you listen to it. I hope that her way of looking at this will be as revelatory to you as it was to me. And if it isn't, I hope that it will be at least helpful in making you see why you believe what you believe. As always, you can email me at EzraKleinShow at Vox.com. Again, EzraKleinShow at Vox.com. I'm very interested in hearing what you think of this podcast. Here is Melanie Joy. Melanie Joy, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks so much for having me. L let's begin with the obvious question. What is carnism? Well, probably the easiest way to understand carnism is through a thought experiment. So if you imagine that you're a guest at a dinner party and you're eating a delicious beef stew and you ask your host for the recipe and your host replies that the secret is in the meat, you need to use three pounds of well-seasoned golden retriever. Your reaction is an example of what I would call carnism. Carnism is the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions us to eat certain animals. So we feel disgusted at the idea of eating dogs or cats, at least in many places in the Western world, and yet we don't feel disgusted at the idea of eating those animals that carnism has conditioned us to think of as edible. So we tend to believe that a certain behavior is natural simply because we've been doing it for a period of time. And there's no question that we've been eating animals for millennia. Um, we've also been murdering each other for millennia and raping people for millennia. And so we have to be really careful when we start using natural as a synonym for justifiable. I think it's very important to look at why we're so wedded to this idea of something being natural and how we're defining the concept of something being natural. Most people really care about animals and would never want to cause them to suffer, especially when that suffering is so intensive and, and so completely unnecessary. And so carnism and systems like carnism need to use a set of psychological defense mechanisms that essentially distort our perceptions and therefore numb our feelings. They disconnect us from our natural empathy toward farmed animals so that we can act against our values and ultimately against our own interests and the interests of others without even realizing what we're doing. What was your path to this point? What, what was your path first to assuming it wasn't something you grew up with, giving up meat, and then to seeing there's being a system here that, that you wanted to name and define and describe? Yeah. I mean, like I said earlier, I, I was, you know, a, I, I grew up with a dog who I loved. I always had a bond with an animal and I don't think it's necessary to have a bond with an animal to care about animals. Peter Singer says that in Animal Liberation, you don't have to be an animal lover to not want to support injustice against them. But I, I was that person. Um, I also was the meat lover's pizza girl. So, you know, I did very much enjoy eating meat and eggs and dairy. And what happened for me was that a long time ago in 1989, when I was 23, I ate a hamburger that was contaminated with Campylobacter. I was living in Boston at the time and I wound up, it, that's like salmonella. Um, I wound up in the hospital Beth Israel Hospital on IV antibiotics. And after that, I did not want to eat meat again. I was just so disgusted by it. And it wasn't at the time, you know, an ethical drive that I had. It's just like when you have a horrible gastrointestinal thing, you just don't want to eat the last thing you would put in your mouth. So, so that's really what happened to me. And then I was learning about my new diet, which was vegetarian. And in this exploration, it led me to information about animal agriculture, of course. This was in the days before the internet. And I was shocked and horrified at what I learned. I was shocked at what was happening to the animals and what was happening to the environment. And like I said, I was always somebody who was very concerned with human rights and social justice. And this fit 
you know, very neatly into that existing paradigm that I had. It was clearly an atrocity and a grave injustice, massive injustice. So I was really shocked by this. But what shocked me, perhaps in some ways even more, was that nobody I talked to about what I had learned was willing to hear what I had to say. You know, they would say, like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal, you know, or just, like, stop talking about that, you crazy vegetarian hippie propagandist. And these were people I was close to. These were rational, compassionate people like myself. And so I became very curious about how people could just stop thinking and feeling when it came to this critical social issue issue. And, and that's what led me to do my doctoral dissertation, my doctoral research. And I originally was studying the psychology of violence and nonviolence because, you know, as I've said, my interest goes beyond our relationship with non-human animals. You know, I'm really interested and have always been very interested in how it's possible for atrocities to be carried out in the world. You know, how is it possible for the populace to turn away from a reality that they feel is just too painful to face? And I figured if I could understand the psychology of what, you know, enables good people to turn away from atrocities, then I could understand the psychology of, you know, how we might be able to invite people to bear witness and to participate in these important conversations. And and that was what led me to write my doctoral dissertation on carnism and to start, like, building my theory from there. I'd like you to talk a little bit about why it is important and it hadn't been done to name carnism. Why, why was it important to give the eating that we all just think of as eating a different name? Yeah, well, or eating animals, right? You know, because if we don't name it, we can't see it. We can't talk about it. You know, imagine trying to argue for affirmative action if nobody had named racism, you know, or some of the other initiatives that we are pushing for to bring about positive social change. It's if we don't name carnism, then eating animals is seen as an ideologically neutral behavior, as just a given, as as just the way things are. We tend to assume that only vegans and vegetarians follow a belief system because vegetarianism and veganism had been named while carnism had not been named. But eating animals does result from a belief system. I mean, whenever a choice is or a behavior is not a necessity, then it's a choice and choices always stem from belief. So the only reason that we learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for example, is because we do follow this belief system of, of carnism. This to me feels like an insight that goes far beyond how we eat. This idea that there are dominant ideologies that are so entrenched around us that they cease to be something that we feel we are making choices in and they just become us. They just become the water we swim in. I, I think you you tell the story, the sort of a famous story of what is it the fish saying, the water's choppy today, and the other fish says, what's water? Right, right. And when you look around the world, do you think that there are others like that? Do you look and see other ideologies that you wish someone would name? Because until somebody does, we don't realize the degree to which we are operating under their thrall. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think the important, I think the most important point is to really, you know, getting back to what you were saying before, developing a practice of reflection, um, self-reflection, reflecting on our choices so that we don't, because our tendency, we are socialized to go to sleep and to become complacent and not to ask why and not to critically examine our behaviors and really think about the impact of our behaviors on others. It's important to recognize too that, you know, the very mentality in my research this was what was, you know, one of the very interesting things for me, the very mentality that enables us to cause harm to other human groups is the same mentality that enables us to cause harm to non-human groups, non-human individuals. This is not equating the suffering of individuals. You know, the suffering of one group and one individual is always going to be unique. So I would never say looking at what women have had to live with, you know, is the same as what farmed animals have had to live with. You, you can't make a comparison like that. I would, however, suggest that we have a responsibility to compare various violent ideologies because they are structured in a similar way. And if we don't unravel the threads that are woven through all violent ideologies and really look at the mentality of violence, then we are simply going to recreate atrocities in new forms. For decades, credit cards have been telling us to buy it now and pay for it later with interest. 
The point of that business model is obvious. It is that the interest can get out of control fast, which is good for them and very bad for you. With Lending Club, you can consolidate your debt or pay off credit cards with one fixed monthly payment. Since 07, Lending Club has helped millions of people regain control of their finances with affordable fixed rate personal loans. There are no trips to a bank, no high interest credit cards. You just go to LendingClub.com, tell them about yourself, how much you need to borrow, pick the terms that are right for you, and if you're approved, your loan is automatically deposited into your bank account in as little as a few days. Lending Club is the number one peer-to-peer lending platform with over $35 billion in loans issued. So go to LendingClub.com slash EZRA, check your rate in minutes and borrow up to $40,000. That is LendingClub.com slash EZRA. Again, LendingClub.com slash EZRA. All loans here are made by WebBank, a member of the FDIC and an equal housing lender. So I want to stay on that point of suffering for a minute and the the way most people feel about suffering. To me, the thing that has been the most personally transformative about opening up to what I already knew is recognizing how long I had put the suffering of so many creatures just out of my mind. And, And I'd like you to talk about that a bit, because one of the things that I think makes this issue different than a lot of the ones I deal with, than a lot of, say, tax issues or or issues about should a particular conflict happen. There are a lot of places where people disagree. They disagree on on the facts. They disagree on the right outcome. They disagree on what the likely outcome of the action will be. But this is a place where virtually everyone I know, everyone I've ever met, feels strongly that animals should not be cruelly treated. If they saw me kicking a dog, they would tackle me to the ground and get me arrested. And yet, what we permit to happen in our names and what we support through our dollars in terms of how animals are treated and in, in, particularly in factory farming is a tremendous violation to that empathy. So talk a little bit about that contradiction. How do people who are decent, who think of themselves as people who love animals, who share gifts on Reddit or on Twitter of adorable baby pigs doing fun things, then let it all go when something smells delicious? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great question. And I think it's really important to recognize that carnism is so entrenched. It is so, so deeply, deeply entrenched. You know, we are conditioned to check our critical thinking at the door and to eat animals without questioning why, without even thinking about the fact that we're eating animals from the moment we're weaned. We have people putting dead animals in our mouths and we are conditioned over and over and over again not to pause and interrupt this carnistic consciousness to reflect on what we're doing, not even to realize that we have a choice when it comes to eating animals. I mean, when I was growing up, I was a person who certainly cared about animals. I I grew up with a dog who I loved like a family member. I grew up as a person who was deeply concerned with issues of justice. And yet I also regularly consumed animals without a second thought to what I was doing. I just, it was incredible that I, I never thought about how strange it was that I could be petting my dog with one hand hand, you know, while I ate a pork chop with the other, uh, a pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sensitive as my dog. And so this system, carnism, is so deeply institutionalized and internalized that it is possible, and indeed this happens, as you point out, for good people to participate in harmful practices without realizing what they're doing. The carnistic norm Our whole society and meat-eating societies are structured to celebrate eating animals, never to get us to question, you know, whether we believe in eating animals, how we feel about eating animals. If we want to eat animals, we're just conditioned to do it. It's just the way things are. So most of us are operating on autopilot, and we believe we're making our food choices freely. In fact, one argument against vegan advocacy is this idea, this, um, it's a defensive idea that comes from carnivores of this carnistic mentality that vegans or people who are advocating moving toward a vegan or a plant-based diet want to rob everyone of their freedom of choice. But really, without awareness, there is no free choice. Most of us have no idea that some of our deepest preferences have been conditioned by a belief system that's outside of our awareness and therefore outside of our control. So I want to take this a little bit personally for a second here. I have done a lot of these podcasts, and this is maybe the one of all of them uh, that I feel most uncomfortable doing. I can listen to this, and I can listen to it using my ears of five or six years ago, and hear the way it will make people feel defensive, uncomfortable, like we are sitting here saying, oh, aren't we superior, us plant-based eaters? 
I've thought a lot in the last couple of months and have been really struggling with this question of how much to let this part of my moral framework come out into my work. If you were a tax policy expert, I could sit here and like pound the table about the way we do taxes in this country and get all into a moral fervor and begin yelling and talk about how unfair it is in the 1%. And it would be completely societally normal. Doesn't mean everybody will agree. It would be a controversial opinion. Same, you know, with some of my views about healthcare and all kinds of things that we debate in politics. There is no view that I hold closer that seems to be more obviously correct and that makes me more uncomfortable to talk about publicly than that I think we are executing a massive, atrocious, morally, completely unjustifiable abuse of animals all the time in numbers that we almost can't bear to think about. And I've been thinking a lot about why someone who's as comfortable with political debate as I am feels so uncomfortable even discussing this, this thing where it means that I I look at a lot of people who I love and who I think are good people and try to be good people and feel that they're constantly doing something that shouldn't be done. And this is something that you talk a lot about in the book. So I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about this because – if you are a listener of this, if I, if, if somebody has trusted us enough to listen this far, but here they hear us saying they're part of this terrible dominant ideology that does all this violence to all these creatures, how do you absorb this? How do we create a discourse that people on both sides can be part of? Yeah, it's a great question. And I appreciate hearing your personal experience of this. And I understand it. And I think this is in part because this conversation is not happening to the degree that some of the other sensitive conversations have been. I mean, this conversation about eating animals and the ethics of eating animals is a relatively, I mean, it's existed for hundreds of years, actually, thousands of years. But, you know, it hasn't really started to reach a level of discourse yet that other sensitive conversations have. And so there's still is a way that you are voicing the opinion of a very small minority of, of individuals right now. I think it's important, and you ask a really important question, um, it's really important to think about how to have this conversation in a way that reduces defensiveness rather than increases it. And that's really the challenge, and it's also the opportunity. Um, and this is where understanding carnism can be so useful. As I said, carnism is organized around these defenses, and when we're born into the carnistic system, which we all are, we internalize them. And so there's a natural defensiveness that most people who haven't become aware of carnism and stepped outside of that box will feel when this issue is being raised. And that's understandable. And you talk about how do we have this conversation so that people on both sides feel comfortable enough to engage in it. I think one way to do that is to not even think of there being two sides. In my newer book, Beyond Beliefs, I talk about thinking of carnism as sort of an intruder in our relationships and in our interpersonal interactions. Um, whether we are vegan or we're not vegan, carnism is not in alignment with any of our values. Carnism is against all of our interests. And I think it's very important to see carnism and veganism on a spectrum as well. And it's not a question of where you are on the spectrum that is as important anyway as, as where you're heading on that spectrum. And so when I talk about this issue, and I've given talks on carnism to audiences of hundreds of meat eaters, non-vegans, I am always approaching it from this assumption that we are all in this together, that people who eat animals are not fundamentally bad people or immoral people, simply that all of us have been conditioned into this practice that most of us would choose not to engage in if we had been given the opportunity to become more aware and the practical means to become less invested. You know, for some people, it's, it's tricky to transition from carnism. One of the things that I suggest that vegans do when they're having this conversation is to think of the people they're talking to who are not vegan or to think of the issue as not being about, you know, either you're vegan and you're part of the solution or you're not vegan and you're part of the problem, but rather how can all of us be a part of the solution in transforming carnism, which as you rightly point out is a system that's antithetical to what most of us truly believe in and want for the world. And I talk about seeing people who are not vegan, but who are supportive of vegan values and vegan ideology, which is many, many people, as vegan allies. People don't have to simply stop eating animals in order to be a part of the solution. 
for whatever reason, you know, many people feel that it's not possible for them to become fully vegan. And for some people, it truly isn't possible. They might be economically or geographically unable to do so. And yet they can still be a supporter of the cause. So one of the things that I think is helpful to do here for me is to actually look at my defense mechanisms rather than this being sort of the unnamed others. Something that I've reflected on a lot since I've made some of these changes in my own life is I would say there was a period of I would judge it as about five, six years, something in that area where I held basically every view I hold now. But I bounced back and forth between vegetarianism or sort of modified versions of vegetarianism. And then sometimes I would just fail out for you know a year and I would just eat meat completely normally uh, and constantly. And one of the things I've thought about a lot looking back on that period was how much I had a moral framework that I was able to simply push out of my mind, how much I – believed that I was participating in something that was wrong and something that was causing creatures who could feel a tremendous amount of pain. And I just stopped thinking about it. It's not that I came up with some clever rationalization or some alternative argument. I just didn't think about it. And one of the things that that has been for me is a bit of an epiphany in terms of how I, in any number of circumstances, could be part of a society that was doing terrible things. And even as I was not trying to be a terrible person or even as I didn't hold terrible opinions, I would just let them happen because it was just easier to go along. And and the human capacity, my own capacity to push things that I know to be wrong out of my head because it is just easier to not worry about it is pretty tremendous. And on the one hand, that feels like maybe a, it's a necessary capacity for living. There is so much suffering at all times and to let it all in all the time would be debilitating. But on the other hand, one of the things that I, I do wonder about is that the practice of doing that makes it easier to do in the future. And I felt that since I've stopped doing it here, it's been easier for me to stop doing it, it elsewhere. But I'm curious how much you, you think about that in your work. What does it do to us? to just know something is wrong, but stop worrying about it? You know, it's it's a good question. And I do think about this quite a bit. You know, I think on one hand, it's really important for us to all accept that we live with a lot of contradictions. I don't like the term hypocrisy, you know, but we live with a lot of contradictions in our lives. We have inherited a messy world, a very messy world. We didn't create the mess that we found ourselves in, um, but we've been born into it. Um, For better or worse, we can choose how we relate to it, but we really have to accept the fact that we need to relate to the world the way it is and sometimes make choices that are not ideal choices in that they're not the same choices we would make if we were living in an ideal world, you know? So, and we have to be aware of the fact that we all have different needs for what is sustainable for us. So, you know, for example, I'm sitting here talking to you and I'm wearing my vegan shoes that I bought from a store here in Germany, and they probably were made in China. And I don't feel comfortable about that for a lot of reasons. And that's a contradiction in myself that I live with. And I accept, we need to accept that we are all complicated and messy and very far from perfect. And so at the same time, I think it's important to be committed to reflecting on our choices on an ongoing basis so that we don't get complacent. There is absolutely this tendency to go to sleep. There's this tendency, especially when there's a an ideology that is, is so normalized, like carnism. You know, the entire structure of society is uh, organized to pull us back into the carnistic cocoon of no- unknowing so that we continue to follow these paths of least resistance and, and continue to eat animals. So that is going to be the tendency. And I think we, we need to recognize that all of us have limits in terms of what we can commit to doing and what kind of change we can commit to engaging in that feels sustainable and doable for us. And at the same time, be compassionate to ourselves in the process and know that we're all going to be far from perfect. You know what's great about eating your favorite thing? That it's your favorite thing and you are eating it. Probably if you're like me, you are eating it covered in sriracha. This one's not a hard sell. If it wasn't good, it would not be your favorite thing. The problem is it can be hard to get your favorite thing to eat. The people who make your favorite thing, maybe they don't do delivery or maybe their delivery van broke down. So there's something you want. You know what you want but you end up settling for something you don't want. That sucks. It is 2018. We put a man on the moon. We can edit human DNA. You should be able to get the food you want delivered for lunch. 
Introducing Postmates, the app that adds a delivery option to your favorite restaurants, even when many of them don't have one. Imagine anything you want to eat delivered. You don't have to drive, park, or even talk on the phone to order. You just download the app and order 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Postmates will bring you what you want within the hour. You can even see where your food is. You can track your driver. And it's not just meals. You forgot to get eggs and milk? No problem. Craving a tasty burger? Check. Looking for that perfect bottle of red wine or a summer beer? Order up. For a limited time, Postmates is giving you $100 of free delivery credit, $100 for your first seven days. To start your free deliveries, download the app today and use code EZRA100. That is code EZRA100 for $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days. Save the hassle, get the food you love, get it really fast at Postmates with code EZRA100. You have a line in the book where you write, violent ideologies are structured so that it is not only possible but inevitable that we are aware of an unpleasant truth on one level while being oblivious to it on another. Common to all violent ideologies is this phenomenon of knowing without knowing. What do you mean by knowing without knowing? That was a phrase coined by the psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton, who wrote the book The Nazi Doctors. And he was you know, very interested about how these men, they were all men at the time, could spend their lives, their days in the killing fields and then go home to their wives and children as, at least in the beginning, relatively loving fathers and, and husbands. And he looked at this phenomenon that he called psychic numbing, this ability of uh, humans to numb themselves psychologically, to disconnect from the reality of their experience, to disconnect from their authentic thoughts and feelings. And so when it comes to eating animals, we employ this psychic numbing, what I call maladaptive psychic numbing, because you can use psychic numbing in an adaptive way, which you alluded to earlier, you know, to cope with violence rather than to perpetuate violence or enable violence. But when we engage in this psychic numbing, which is basically numbing ourselves to the reality of what we're participating in or the reality of what's happening around us, but we're not intervening in, we don't become completely ignorant of what's happening. We simply aren't conscious of it. So a knowing without knowing is having on one hand an awareness of an unpleasant truth, and on the other hand, choosing not to allow that awareness to surface into consciousness. I want to talk about the experience then of knowing. I've begun to think of this as taking the green pill. You use a lot of matrix analogies in the book and and taking various pills has become a, something that we have in our lexicon. I have found that one of the really strange parts of this, and I want to be open about sort of my path here. I've only actually been vegan for probably about a year and a half, you know, and, and through some of that time, it was a little bit shaky. And before that, I was vegetarian. And before that, I was vegetarian with some exceptions. And so I say this as somebody who is new to this space, who has lived for a very, very long time holding a lot of these opinions and doing almost nothing about them. So I say nothing here from a a space of moral superiority and nothing here from a place where I don't recognize that I could slip back into my old ways at, at any minute. But the longer I have tried to take these views and ideas seriously, the longer I've tried to force myself to to read about this and to look at some of the investigations into slaughterhouses and to just confront what was going on around me, there's been a, a, a way in which the world has become gruesome in a fashion that I find genuinely hard to deal with. And and I'll I'll just give one small example. So I'm in California for a book leave right now. And in California, there are a lot of Chick-fil-A billboards. And what the billboards have is they have a kind of 3D paper mache or something. Maybe it's a wireframe cow, right? They've got like a little cow statue that is popped out of the billboard. And the cow statue has a spray paint bottle. And on the billboard, the billboard is purely white and just spray painted in a kind of comical misspelling is eat more chicken. And so the joke is you've got these cows that are spray painting billboards all around California to eat more chickens for Chick-fil-A because the cows don't want to be tortured and killed to be food. They'd prefer you do that to the chickens instead because they're trying to preserve their own life. And these billboards are supposed to be funny. Right. Like there's an ad, like an expensive ad agency came up with this and this got greenlit and then it did well enough to be all over because it is. It's kind of funny until you think about what the joke is. And then it's genuinely stomach turning. And there's a way in which when you open to it, the world becomes a little bit hard to deal with 
you are with people who you love and, and they're eating stuff that, that the more you think about it, the harder it gets to deal with it. I don't think it's an accident that your most recent book is about the difficulty that vegans and non-vegans have in relationships together. Because sort of once you fall through the looking glass on this, you end up falling pretty far. And the process of letting it all in, it's very alienating. It makes you feel simultaneously like constantly repelled and disappointed and also like kind of like an asshole because you're sitting here judging everyone around you. It's a very psychically uncomfortable place to be in. There are interesting times that we live in for sure. And it's true. And and to reiterate a phrase that was coined by feminists, I think in the 1960s and apply it to veganism, you know, once you open your eyes, as you were saying, once you open to this reality, you don't see different things. You see the same things differently. The world looks very different once you allow yourself to take in the reality of what is happening to 70 some odd billion land animals alone every single year. And no question, we live in the midst of a global atrocity. Carnism is a global atrocity. More farmed animals are slaughtered in one week than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout human history. And once you allow yourself to take in the reality that that's happening and, you know, you, you start to see things quite differently. So many people who have opened up to this reality, which I believe is very important, Um, It is deeply empowering in many ways because it allows us to live more authentic and freely chosen lives. There is a a freedom and, and a lot of energy that also comes with not having to work psychologically so hard to remain unaware of what's right in front of us. So there are a lot of really good reasons to to be open to this conversation and this reality. And, And of course, there are health benefits as well. And that's a whole other conversation. And at the same time, it is challenging. It's challenging because this conversation, as I said, is new. The vegan movement, you know, it's one of the fastest growing social justice movements in the world today, unquestionably. I travel around the world for a living. I've been to 42 countries now, and I travel around talking about carnism, and it's been really amazing to witness the transformation that I've I've seen. And I hear stories from people over and over and over again um, from vegans and vegetarians who really struggle as people who have woken up to this awareness and and who have to navigate these very complicated interpersonal dynamics and and navigate living in a world that they perceive as so relationally dysfunctional in terms of how we relate to farmed animals anyway. And of course, this affects their interpersonal relationships as well. I I do want to point out, though, that I think it's important not to think of this as an issue that only impacts vegans or that the transformation of carnism requires that we all become vegan, as I said earlier. I think, you know, most people would be and would want to be on board with reducing their participation in carnism and with helping transform this violent system that is carnism. And I think when we can start framing the conversation that way, it'll be easier to talk about it more openly. The tricky thing also is, as as I wrote in my book, is that carnism conditions us to feel defended against and resist the very message that would help us get out of the carnistic box in the first place. And that means resisting what we perceive as veganism or vegan messaging. Well, let me take the other side of this point here, because I think what you often hear from folks is vegans make some good points, but they are self-righteous. Um, you know, PETA annoys me. They're constantly splashing blood on people. They're judgy. You know, they there are all kinds of other things that people do that are probably worse. You know, why are you worrying about this as opposed to, you know, children without food in Africa? There is a set of arguments that happen here and, and a set of arguments that I have felt, right? Not not directed towards me, but that I felt as a, as a meat eater. And sometimes, that, frankly, that I feel as a vegan still. I look at some of the rhetoric around me or I look at the way people, you know, talk about it. And I think there's too much self-righteousness there. Talk to me a little bit about the way in which that discourse happens, because on the one hand, um, yeah, like there are defense mechanisms to push people back. On the other hand, there are social dynamics that we are all used to that that are, are constant in all of our lives that keep us from 
laying the sword on on each other all the time due to our differing moral frameworks because you know depending on where you sit you know there are religious people who think that i am helping condemn the world to hellfire i mean people people believe all kinds of things that within their frameworks make what others are doing really profound i mean take um social conservatives in abortion you know who who see an ongoing mass murder happening at all times and to relate to other people with the fullness that that takes is very very difficult and can drive them also to very extreme measures. So how do you have a framework that makes the world look like a very difficult and dangerous place, but also operate within that world in a way that retains social bonds and retains a kind of ongoing community that we need as human beings to be healthy and to be happy and and over time even to make progress? Right. I mean, it's difficult. Um, You can feel like you're walking a tightrope a lot of the time. And in some ways, it forces us to do the difficult but important work of developing ourselves and becoming our fullest selves that we can be. Um, We all need to learn to live, as I said earlier, with contradictions. Um, We need to be able to embrace nuance. We need to be able to be careful not to get into this rigid mindset, this black and white, you're with us, you're against us, you're part of the solution, you're part of the problem, or to adopt what I refer to as a trauma narrative. People who have witnessed atrocities, people who have witnessed depression and who have been working for social justice can also fall into this um, tendency after hearing story after story after story of survivor or seeing image after image of, you know, animals being slaughtered, whatever it may be, we can start to see the world as one giant traumatic event with only three roles to be played, victim, perpetrator, and hero. And we can start putting every Everybody, including ourselves, into these categories and having really rigid boundaries around them. One of the ways that I've, you know, tried to help contextualize this conversation and, and, and open it up to more nuance is by describing, um, in my writing, I talk about carnistic defenses, and in my later writing in Beyond Beliefs, um, I differentiate between primary and secondary defenses. And so primary defenses are defenses that validate the ideology itself, right? So primary carnistic defenses essentially validate this idea that eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. Um, It's legitimate. It's the right thing to do. Secondary defenses are defenses that invalidate the counter system, the system that's challenging the ideology. In this case, you know, we're talking about veganism also could apply, for example, to feminism, feminists who are challenging challenging patriarchy. And secondary defenses are defenses, they, they in, in this case, they invalidate veganism, and they do this by invalidating vegans, vegan ideology, and also the vegan movement as a whole. So some of what you described are these very typical stereotypes that we learn to think about vegans that are in many ways inaccurate, And yet, regardless, they're used to silence the voices of those who are challenging carnism and working to raise awareness of carnism. One of those ideas is like the moralistic vegan. You know, when we believe in these stereotypes, it's a form of shooting the messenger, right? If you shoot the messenger, you don't have to take seriously the implications of their message. So, you know, we tend to assume that vegans are biased, so we shouldn't take seriously the information they're sharing. And that's in part because we don't recognize that carnistic bias permeates society. So when we study nutrition, for example, we're actually studying carnistic nutrition. Do you want to say a word on that? Because I thought that was an interesting point you made on your book. What what do you mean when you say when we study nutrition, we are studying carnistic nutrition? Because carnism permeates all social institutions, including education, science, and nutrition. The carnistic bias is, is everywhere. Now, this is starting to become challenged as more and more research demonstrates the, the dangers of eating an animal-based diet and the benefits of eating a plant-based diet. But still, when people go to school to learn nutrition, they are essentially learning carnistic nutrition because that's the dominant system that's informing the institution that they are studying within. There's a a side of this that worries me sometimes. So I buy into veganism for ethical reasons. But one thing I notice, and I see this in a lot of different social movements, there's a tendency to buy into the all good fallacy, where if something is good, everything about it has to be good and everything about the opposite of it has to be bad. And I see this here with vegans sometimes. It is clear to me that one can eat a very healthy vegan diet. It's also clear to me that one can eat a very healthy Mediterranean diet that includes fish and you know not that much red meat. And I struggle here because I think that there is a weakness it opens up in the conversation and a a kind of 
argument from self-interest that may or may not in the long run prove true, that, that many folks who believe in a plant-based diet make. I, I will see meat eating framed as this obviously unbelievably unhealthy thing where it seems to me that the ethical argument, which often is harder to persuade people of, is the only one that really is certain to hold up. It can be very hard, it seems to me, for people to you know, hold the idea that something they believe is really important and really good may not be may not be better in all respects. They sort of don't want the other side to have any points. And and I'm curious if you think there's validity to that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a nutritionist, so I'm I'm not going to speak to this to the science. Although you know, I do work with a number of people who who work in nutrition and and medicine. Um, and I do think it's important. There's no question that the traditional tr- nutrition that people learn is carnistic nutrition because carnism is the dominant nutritional paradigm paradigm at this point in time. So there's just no way around that. There's also no question that there's a tremendous amount of of scientific literature now that is, in fact, demonstrating the benefits of a plant-based diet and some of the dangers of eating an animal-based diet. And this is, you know, quite well established and and, and quite well known. You know, the correlation between, for example, eating animal products and certain types of cancers or obesity, heart disease, even mainstream medical practitioners and nutritionists uh, advocate meat reduction, at least, and moving toward a plant-based diet. The question, you know, really remains whether an entirely plant-based diet is the best diet you could possibly have, you know, compared to another diet that maybe has small amounts of animal products in it. I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know that it's an important question to answer. I think we have enough information now to know that we can live for people who can afford to and who are geographically able to make their food choices freely can certainly live well and, you know, healthy lives on a plant-based diet. What about the midway point many people want to go to, a midway point I've been in myself, of humane meat, right? Cage-free eggs, um, you know, meat that you buy at the farmer's market that is raised on a farm by by someone who will tell you about the cow. How do you think about that space where people say, "I, I want to keep my diet and I'm willing to spend the money to make it less cruel, and and isn't that enough? Yeah, I think that most people, to my knowledge, are making that choice to vote with their dollar to do less harm because they genuinely do care. And that matters. And that gives me hope for humanity, for sure. And of course, it's also important to raise awareness of the fact that this idea of, you know, what's called humane meat, I call it compassionate carnism, is still a form of carnism. And it's actually a, a PR strategy that was developed by animal agribusiness as their profits were starting to take a hit from more and more people becoming aware of and concerned with factory farming. When we look at this question through the lens of carnism, it's easier to see how so-called humane meat is, in fact, a form of carnism. You know, most of us, for example, would find it cruel to slaughter a happy, healthy golden retriever simply because people like the way her legs taste. And yet, when we do the exact same thing to individuals of other species, carnistic industry wants us to consider that humane or or compassionate. I recommend that people who do want to do less harm consider moving along the carnistic spectrum. And I always advocate that people try to be as vegan as possible. And I like that framing because it gives people the opportunity, you know, it's the generosity of allowing individuals to decide what is in fact possible for them, what is in fact sustainable for them. It encourages people to to reflect at each meal. How vegan can I actually make this meal? How plant-based can I make this meal? And therefore, you know, people who feel like they're not ready to become fully vegan, or maybe they never want to become fully vegan, have the opportunity to do so and still know that they are making changes that are helping to reduce their participation in carnism. So my background is magazine journalism. My first job in the industry was at the American Prospect. My goal in life as a writer was one day to write for the New York Review of Books. Uh, I love magazines. They are deep while being current. They're beautifully written while still being sharp. But as a a physical technology in this age, they leave a little something to be desired. They're they're heavy if you want to have a lot of them. They rip, you misplace them. They have all those little subscription cards everywhere. They get everywhere. They're annoying. It's why Texter has reinvented magazine reading for the digital age. They've got two big innovations here. The first is a binge-style membership, where instead of subscribing to just one magazine at a time, you pay a monthly fee and get full access to over 200 top magazines at once. And this is the best of the best. It is complete issues and back issues of Time, The Atlantic, The New Yorker. The second innovation is it's all digital. So it's wherever you have your tablet or your smartphone. 
Their app has won design awards. It displays photos, videos, beautiful layout, all of it as a magazine editor's intended. This is not just pulling out an article. You're actually reading the magazine as it was designed to be read as a magazine. And while you can have thousands of them, the whole thing only weighs as much as your smartphone. So Texture is giving listeners of this show a free trial. To start your seven-day free trial, go to texture.com slash EZRA. Again, try Texture for free for seven days at texture.com slash EZRA. That is texture.com slash EZRA. I'd also like to talk about vegetarianism here because we've not discussed that that much. That's actually, I think, the the eating system here most people fall into when they begin to see meat eating as morally problematic. But I think that the way eggs are produced, dairy is produced, is also less well understood um, and less well known. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Why do you think it is important to move away from from eggs and, and dairy? What is the lived experience of egg-laying chickens and um, dairy-producing cows? Most people who really learn about the reality of how eggs and dairy are produced would find this production like deeply, deeply offensive. The brutality of these industries is no different than the brutality of, of other carnistic industries. In some ways, the numbers are even higher when it comes to egg laying chickens in terms of you know how many individuals are killed. Egg laying chickens or hens actually, they're crammed into these tiny cages. They can barely turn around, even so-called free range. Um, hens are, they have their beaks cut off without any painkiller whatsoever so that they can't peck each other um, and harm each other because they're in such close quarters that that often happens. The male chicks are taken and just quote unquote, destroyed immediately after birth. They're thrown into sometimes meat grinders. They're suffocated in in bags. They're killed in these incredibly horrific ways. The life of an egg laying hen is just a life of misery. The life of a cow who is raised to produce dairy is also a life of misery. Um, First of all, we have to force somebody, uh, an individual to become pregnant when she's obviously not opting to do that herself. So these animals are forcibly impregnated in and of itself. That's a deeply problematic process. In order to take the milk that's designed for her baby and harvest it for humans, we need to take away her baby. And often the the calf is taken from a mother, sometimes hours or days after birth. And the bond between bovines is, you know, I don't want to say no different because I don't know what it is, but it certainly is a maternal bond that humans can relate to when they think of their own feeling of maternal bond. And these babies and mothers will howl and cry. Mothers have been known to bellow for days and desperately try to search for their babies. Um, It's really some of the most haunting images and and sounds that I have ever been exposed to have been the sounds of mother cows after their babies have been removed. And then their milk is taken to feed humans. um, And then they're impregnated over again. And this cycle is continued until they're spent and sent to the very same slaughterhouses that steers are sent to, to become hamburger or whatever else. How much time do you spend speaking to people who have actually worked in the meat industry? When I was doing my research for For my doctoral dissertation, I interviewed people who worked in the meat industry. And since then, I haven't been spending time talking to people who are working in the meat industry, but for the meat industry. Um, I work for ProVeg International here in Berlin. And one of the things the organization does is is work with meat producers to develop vegan alternatives, which is uh, quite a booming business here in Germany and starting to be a booming business in in other places as well. When you were doing that doctoral dissertation research, And when you speak to people now, what do they tell you, right? What do you hear from them about what it is like to do that all day that either makes you question your beliefs on this, right? I mean, in in some ways, what what they're being accused of here within this moral framework is is unbelievably barbaric. But I'm sure when you meet them, they, they seem like pretty normal people or that makes you question their beliefs. I mean, I mean, how do you reconcile their humanity with what? you see them as doing? Yeah, I really personally see the system as the problem, not the individuals within the system. This is not absolving people of personal responsibility. But as a psychologist, you know, somebody who really does have an understanding of um, human psychology, especially in this area, it's completely understandable to me how people can compartmentalize and, you know, 
contribute to this incredible harm um, without actually being bad people in the process. People are deeply socialized into this way of being. As I said earlier, most people that who actually work in slaughterhouses and meat packing plants are not people who want to be there because they enjoy killing animals. You know, many of them are, are immigrants, undocumented immigrants, people who have absolutely no choice as to how they try to earn a living. And then they end up working in an industry which which is, you know, one of the most dangerous industries to work in. And the rates of, of, of accidents are extremely high. And, you know, it takes a psychological toll to be in the killing fields in this particular way. So, so I have no personal, you know, issue with this or concern about this. And I very much understand that many people do what they do because it's what they feel they have to do. There are people I have spoken to who are, you know, in more privileged positions, um, you know, who run meat production companies, um, and who, you know, some people for sure simply don't care. And, you know, they're after the bottom line and it is what it is. And you find those people outside of the meat industry as well. And there are also many people who have been doing this kind of work because, it's what they've always done. It's been in their family. And they haven't really stopped to think about another way of being. And some of these people are, in fact, very open to switching from producing animals to starting to produce non-animal-based meats and, and other products. What do you see as the sort of first easy steps? How do you begin to, to break something when, you know, as you write in the book and as you say in this discussion— Everything around you all the time is trying to tempt you back into conformity. Yeah, people can come at this issue from, from a variety of different angles. I mean, it really depends. Some people come come to it from concern about the environment. Some people from animal welfare concerns. Um, other people who are concerned with their health and they're simply reducing their consumption of animal products find that they have less to defend and therefore are more receptive to this information that is also already out there. We've talked about how carnism is so entrenched and it's surrounding us and it's kind of constantly pulling us back in. And it's true that, you know, information about animal agriculture, about veganism, about the alternative to carnism is also out there for people who are interested and they want to learn more. So it's really about creating a window, you know, a crack in the consciousness so that people are motivated to seek out more information. And this people will open their consciousness based on whatever is important to them, whatever motivation, you know, speaks to them. There's something Yuval Noah Harari has written that, that has influenced me a lot here, where he argues that we are in, without quite being conscious of it, a very unusual historical moment on this issue. We, those of us born in the last 30, 40 years, we're the only generation that has existed at a time when the technology to do massive confined animal feeding operations, huge factory farms where antibiotics control the disease and genetic engineering controls the size and, and on and on and on. So you can have suffering and slaughter and cheap meat on this scale. It isn't to say that at every other time it was nicely done or that there wasn't suffering, but that what we are going through right now is qualitatively and quantitatively different than what previous generations have seen because we are, you know, one of the first generations with the technology to see animal production done at this scale and this level of cruelty without sort of natural biological mechanisms like disease reducing the numbers and 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 pushing us back to a more normal pace and 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 size do you think there's something to that do you think there's something to the idea that we're sort of in between the onset of the technologies that can make this cruel at numbers we've never known before and the coming of the technologies like cellulosic meat and other kinds of plant-based meat creation that will allow compassion to become much easier and, and frankly tastier. Yeah, absolutely. And Yuval Harari actually wrote the foreword to my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows, in, in the Hebrew version. And yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I mean, and it's true, the level of violence at this point point in history, this moment in history that we are carrying out toward farmed animals is absolutely unprecedented. And so, you know, we're more distanced from our food, quote unquote food, animal products than ever before. Um, and we're also becoming more sensitized because when you think about it, in, in my book, I talk about, you know, one of the carnistic defenses um, is justification. And I talk about how we learn to justify this violent ideology by learning to believe that the myths of meat, eggs, and dairy are the facts 
of meat, eggs, and dairy. I call them the three ends of justification. Eating animals is, is normal, natural, and necessary. And of course, these arguments have been used to justify violent practices throughout human history, right? So, but the one end, the key end, in my opinion, is necessary. You know, if you look at violent ideologies throughout history, you can see that many people get behind, or at least they get behind atrocities and, and violent ideologies they, because they believe it's a necessity. If you believe something is a necessity for survival, then it's a matter of self-defense. It's not offense. And what's happening now is that for many people in the world today, not everybody, but for many people in the world today, eating animals is not a necessity. It actually has become a choice. When a behavior becomes a choice, it takes on an ethical dimension that it didn't have in quite the same way before. And so people are starting to grapple with this idea of eating animals in a new way. Of course, the advent of the internet has allowed information to surface and to get through to people that formerly hadn't as well. And so, yeah, I mean, I do think we live in a very interesting moment in history. Where do you suggest people start? Let's say you listen to this and, you know, as you say, there's a big system here and it's hard to get out of all at once. Where, where do you suggest people start? If you wanted to become a little kinder, if you wanted to dip your toe into this, if you wanted to begin to open to this, where, be it reading, be it practice, be it action, be it a YouTube video, where do people begin? What is manageable? Yeah, I mean, I think just wanting to learn is a great step, you know, being willing to learn. On our website, carnism.org, we have some short videos that talk about carnism, and we also have links to resources. There are a variety of resources, depending on, you know, what people are most interested in. But links to resources where they can either read more or, you know, get like a vegetarian or a vegan starter kit where they can do something like a 30-day vegan challenge and, you know, try to go vegan for 30 days. They can come to our website website and link to videos and then resources on our resources page from there. There are some great books out there. Um, if people are interested in nutrition, there's How Not to Die. I don't know if you've heard of that by Dr. Michael Greger. I have not. It came out, I think, a couple of years ago now, and it's been published in a, a number of languages, um, doing really well. And it's a very comprehensive book about, well, it's about nutrition. For people who are in, interested in health, that would be a great book. What are some other books you might recommend if people want to do more reading here? Well, for people who are already kind of vegan-ish or moving toward veganism, vegetarian, vegan, there's a book um, by my colleague Tobias Lehnert called How to Create a Vegan World. And this talks about how to talk about veganism um, and how to think about it and moving the movement forward for sure. Uh, Jonathan Safran Foer's book I know has spoken to a lot of people eating animals, and I believe they're making a film out of it right now. Melanie Joy, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Joy for being here. Thank you to Jeremy Dalmas for engineering this episode. To my producer, Jillian Weinberger, The Ezra Klein Show is a Vox Media podcast production, and we will be back next week. <laughs>